Even though statistics is undoubtedly a difficult subject, the examples in statistics courses often come across as unrealistically simple. It's a bit like those action movies where everything's in exactly the right place, and the henchmen and the villains are inconceivably dumb and careless and unskilled. Uh, the examples in statistics courses put up simple obstacles which are easily overcome just by the application of simple expedient techniques. It's as if the course is meant to convince you that if you just know the right test or the right commands, you can always get the answers you want and overcome seemingly deadly scientific obstacles. Of course, you know it's not like that. Uh, real research, the real sorts of data sets we contend with, put up a fight. They have more complexity, they have missing values, measurement error, and then of course it's the conceptual structure underneath them that's the real challenge. So when we face real data sets, then we meet real terror. In this course, I'm trying simultaneously to make the material learnable and also to give you a sense of that complexity about what real statistical villains are like, not the trivial ones we see in action movies. So the example that motivated last week, this example of gender discrimination in graduate school admissions in the 1970s, uh, is an example where we don't get what we want in the end. But it's a very simple data analysis problem. There's three variables. It seems like we should be able to get what we want using standard regression tools, uh, but we can't. So let me remind you, uh, what we can estimate uh, under the general and reasonable assumptions of the example is the total effect of gender on admissions. But this is not what we want to know. What we want to know is the decomposition uh, into direct and indirect effects of gender on graduate school admissions. And this is plausibly, almost certainly, confounded by unobserved differences in the applications that, uh, in the applicants that drive both where they apply, whether they apply, and affect their chances of admission. And this basic causal structure with a mediating path and a direct effect and plausible unobserved confounds is extremely common. Lots of data analysis will have a structure like this. The lesson from this example isn't that inference is impossible. It's that one of the jobs of statistical education is to tell us when we can't get what we want. And that is an answer. It's a very valuable answer because it stops us from wasting our time, other people's time, and misleading policy. So it's a victory, even though we didn't get what we thought we wanted when we started Let's look at some other examples. And the example for this lecture is motivated by an interest in moral philosophy and moral psychology. So many of you will have heard of trolley problems, uh, but for those of you who haven't, let me introduce you to them. So a trolley problem is a toy philosophical uh, story that is meant to elicit moral psychology in those who listen to it. In the quintessential trolley problem, the story goes, there's a runaway trolley on a track uh, seen at the, the top of the illustration in this slide, and it's speeding out of control, uh, and it will uh, strike five people who, for uh, some reason, uh, are on the track and unaware of it. Um, however, you, the protagonist in, in this story, are standing next to uh, a switch. And if you pull the switch, it'll divert the trolley to a sidetrack where it will strike only one person. And now the question is, having heard this story, suppose the protagonist in this story pulls the switch. How permissible, morally permissible or appropriate is it to pull the switch? Different people have different reactions uh, to this story. And there's a big empirical and philosophical and psychological literature trying to understand that variation. What are the intuitions, uh, the moral theories that lead people uh, to different responses about these stories? For the rest of this lecture, we're going to focus on a large empirical data set that investigates three different principles that are 
hypothetically underlying people's intuitions to things like trolley problems, to moral situations. And these uh, principles are action, intention, and contact. Let me introduce each of them with a simple trolley story. So the action principle is in play in the trolley story you already met, the original trolley story. When the blue individual pulls the switch, it is his action that results in uh, the death of the one individual on the right on the side track. And then we're asked to judge whether that action rather than a lack of action is morally permissible. The second principle is the intention principle. So now we have a modified trolley story in the middle here. There's a side track, but it loops and reconnects to the main track. Again, if you divert the trolley, it'll go on the side track. And in the story, the when the trolley strikes the one poor soul on the right, it will stop the trolley and save the lives of the five at the bottom again. But this time, the death of the one person in the loop is intended. It's not merely a side effect of saving the five lives. It's required to save the five lives. And this is called the intention principle, where a death is intended. And then in those circumstances, how appropriate is it? And then the third principle is the contact principle. Uh, so here's another story. Uh, in this story, uh, you are now not standing next to a switch, but you're on a, a bridge that passes over the track. And you're standing for some reason behind a very large man. And as the runaway trolley speeds towards the five individuals again, who are these five people and why are they always on the track? Uh, you can push the very large man over the railing onto the track and that will stop the trolley and save their lives. This is uh, a story like the loop in the middle where there's intention. It's the um, large man's death uh, as he falls onto the track and stops the trolley is required to save the five lives of the others. So it's not merely a side effect, but it also requires physical contact. And this is a principle that seems to bother people a lot. So the data set we're going to work with, uh, it comes from a, an online study. It's a very large sample of 331 individuals. And we also know their age, their self-reported gender, and their educational level, their highest educational level. Um, I said it's an online study and it was voluntary participation. That fact will become important to us later on. Uh, and in this study, individuals were introduced to 30 different trolley problems. Uh, 30 different stories, and then these stories were modified, mutated, if you will, to contain or remove each of the three principles in a large factorial design. So action, intention, or contact can be added and subtracted to stories by modifying their details. In total, we have at our fingertips uh, almost 10,000 responses, 9,930 responses from these 331 individuals. And what they responded to was the prompt, how appropriate in any specific story is the uh, uh, action or inaction taken? And they give their response on a scale from one to seven, where one means uh, completely inappropriate and seven means completely appropriate. This is what the frequency distribution of the response this look like and this response is going to be our outcome variable and we're going to construct a generalized linear model to analyze these responses as functions of the principles of action intention and contact this kind of variable is called an ordered categorical variable so we need to spend a little bit of time talking about that but first let's talk about the causal structure and figure out what we're actually going to do here what's the estimand in this problem we are interested in the extent to which action, intention, and contact, adding or removing them from a particular trolley story, uh, influences the response that individuals tend to give, where the response is defined on this one to seven scale of how morally appropriate it is. So the most basic uh, causal structure here is just we have some treatment. And since this is an experiment, it has, uh, it's under our control. And what is the influence of that treatment, whether it's action, intention, or contact, or some combination of them, on the responses individuals give. But we're simultaneously interested in 
um, how these causal influences of action, intention, and contact are associated with other variables. And it's not that the other variables confound them because the, the treatments X here are under our control, so they're not confounded, uh, but there are competing causes. For example, there's the story itself. Some stories uh, contain different elements, and those elements may also influence people's moral intuitions, uh, make them more excited or less excited, and affect their responses. Uh, and then there are the demographic variables about the individuals responding, their educational level, their age, their gender, and these could also moderate the response. These competing causes, as they're often caused in statistics, add a lot of noise. Uh, so we often want to include them in models just to reduce the noise so we get a more precise estimate of the treatments. But in this case, they're also a primary research interest because it's we know that individuals vary very much in their moral intuitions, their reactions to these stories. And we want to understand its patterning so that we can develop theories to explain it. Uh, of course, these variables like education, age, and gender also have causal relationships with one another. Uh, so, for example, age influences education, right? Babies have not completed college. Uh, and gender also influences education uh, because uh, gender norms uh, pattern choices in societies and lead to different educational choices, whether it's the subjects or how much education, right? So, for example, in uh, Western uh, societies, uh, women seem to consume more education than men, at least these days. So that's the basic causal structure, and we're going to come back to that DAG again and again in this lecture. Uh, but for now, let's talk about the machinery a little bit. This uh, outcome variable is a very new creature for us, and um, we're going to need a new kind of golem to model it. Ordered categorical variables uh, require some special treatment, and I want to teach that to you. Uh, so what are categories in the first place? Categories are just discrete types, and we've dealt with those sorts of things before, events. And in, normally categories don't have any order to them. So for example, if you had um, animal categories like cat, dog, chicken, there's no natural ordering to this in the sense that chickens are less than dogs and less than cats, uh, however you may feel. Um, uh, that's a normal category. It's unordered. Ordered categories are also discrete types, but they inherently have ordered relationships with one another along some dimension. So for example, sentiments like bad, good, and excellent have a natural ordering. Bad is always uh, below good, and good is below excellent. There are some things that arise from this ordering that we need to take account of when we make statistical models. So the first uh, is that the distance between neighboring values is not the same across the whole range of the outcome variable. So for example, in the case that interests us uh, today, if you ask how appropriate is the action or inaction taken in a story, um, it's probably much easier uh, for uh, uh, adding or subtracting some feature to a story to move an individual from four to five, that is from uh, sort of middle uh, meh response uh, to one above it than it is to go from six to seven, where seven is the maximum. Uh, these different increments have different psychological distances, if you will. The other thing is they're nearly always anchor points, psychological anchor points. So in this study, for example, four in the middle of the scale is loved by a large number of people. Uh, they don't have a strong reaction to the story, condemning it or approving it, they will often choose four. And this is the kind of meh response. And interestingly, not everybody uh, shares the same anchor points. Sometimes they're culture specific, individual specific. If you have favorite numbers or unlucky numbers, you may avoid them and so on. Uh, but quite often people use the middle and the ends of these scales uh, more than the values in between. This is a bit like uh, this, this internet meme, which I am personally very fond of, where we think about different culturally patterned ways to cut up some objective distribution. So suppose there's some uh, distribution of things and um, they have a normal distribution as at the top of this slide. Uh, uh, most of them within plus or minus one standard deviation are pretty good. And then uh, fewer are good going up and, and only in the tail are they awesome and then going the other way 
uh, it's okay, and then a very small number are junk. And some passionless uh, Android, like uh, Lieutenant Data, would rate them exactly as they're distributed. But people don't do things that way. And so when you ask people to respond on a scale of one to seven about how good something is, the same objective goodness will be responded to in different ways. And so individual variation is also important for getting a good scientific signal out of such data. So the stereotypes being that Americans think everything is awesome, uh, and that's pretty much true, cross-culturally speaking, and Eastern Europeans uh, think everything is garbage. So what kind of tide prediction engine or, or golem are we going to make here uh, that can help us model this odd distribution? This doesn't look like any ordinary probability distribution because it isn't. It's, it's something that emerges from a bunch of idiosyncratic psychological features of the task and the people taking the task. But we still need to transform this into a probability distribution so that we can do statistical inference with it. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to make a tide prediction engine for this kind of, well, tide. The trick that's going to get us to where we want to go is to realize that when something is ordered, it's cumulative. And so uh, the frequency distribution on the left, uh, the height of those individual red bars doesn't seem to have any ordering to it at all. In fact, the, the middle value is the tallest. But if we stack them on one another, like I've done on the right-hand side of this slide, to transform an ordinary frequency distribution into a cumulative frequency distribution, and you can see what I've done. I just take, uh, starting on the left at number one, I take number one and I stack it on top of number two, and then take uh, uh, number one and two and stack them on top of number three, and numbers one, two, and three, and stack them on top of number four, and so on. And this makes a cumulative frequency distribution, which has a natural ordering, because now each subsequent value is always bigger than the previous one, even though the distances change. And those distances are just the original frequency distribution on the left. So there's no damage that's been done here, no information has been lost, but now we have represented the data in a way that has a natural ordering. And that's why we, these models always work with cumulative distributions. I appreciate this is a bit weird, so I'm going to spend the next few slides um, stepping through it carefully. Usually when you work with models like this, you can put this uh, detail in the background. The machine always takes care of it for you. But it's good to know what's going on and understand that it's justified. It's not just some bizarre statistical ritual. Uh, so again, on the, on the left of this so slide, I'm just showing you the uh, cumulative uh, frequency distribution, but now I've come, I've uh, converted it to proportions so that the vertical axis is now between 0 and 1. And what you'll see is that the highest level outcome on the horizontal axis, which is 7 in this example, always has a cumulative proportion of 1 because that's the entire sample. It has to be that way. Uh, and then the others are some fraction of the total sample. On the right, i um, represented the same thing, but now what I've done uh, the horizontal axis is not the outcome values, but it's just the vertical axis um, on the log odds scale. So I've taken the cumulative proportion or probability, and I've done a logit transform on it, just like we did for the binomial and logistic regression models last week. <clears throat> and this has converted the, uh, them onto the log odds scale. But now it's not ordinary log odds. Uh, it's cumulative log odds, but it has the same scale the same properties you learned last week about log odds scales, about logit scales. That is zero means 50%, positive numbers push you closer to 100%, and negative numbers closer to 0%. Uh, and now for each of these um, outcome values, we've got a cumulative log odds value that corresponds to it. And this is going to turn out uh, to do everything for us. Now, I'll, I'll walk through the next bit slowly. Uh, before I do, though, I want you to notice that number seven there is cumulative log odds is infinity. And that's because uh, the log odds of one is infinity because it's one divided by zero. So these um, log odds values of each of these points are usually called the cut points. And uh, that is their locations on the horizontal axis on this slide. And these cut points are going to be things that we're going to estimate. They will become parameters. So let me step through this uh, piece by piece. So first realize that it's the spaces between these cut points that are the um, 
uh, probabilities or, or stand for the probabilities, the relative proportions of the different values that are observable. So for example, all of the cumulative log odds below about minus two on this are assigned number one, which is the minimum. And then it's between the cut points, uh, the, the first and second cut points that we get values two, and then between the second and third that we get values three, and so on up until value seven, which is after the highest cut point and before infinity, because it's the rest of the real number line. This lets us define the probability or the likelihood of each observation. So in this example, let R sub I be the response of individual I, and uh, it takes some value K, which is a number between one and seven that's been observed. And it doesn't matter which number, I'm just defining this in general. And so the, the probability of that response, of observing that response, uh, is equal to the difference between the cumulative probabilities uh, that, that R sub i is uh, less than or equal to k, right? That's the probability that it's k or anything smaller, minus the probability that it's one less than k or anything smaller. And so how does this make any sense? Well, this is where the, the cut points give us those probabilities. That's what we've got because we have a cumulative distribution now. And so it's these uh, less than or equal to probabilities that we have in our, in our machine now and not the discrete ones. But we can get the discrete ones back. The probability ri equals any specific value k just by subtracting one from the one right below it. And that's what these cut points are going to do. They represent those probabilities of less than or equal to. That is say, the first cut point is the probability that any observation is less than or equal to one. And the second, the probability that it's less than or equal to two. And the third, the probability it's less than or equal to three, and so on. An example, I appreciate this is weird. Uh, it's weird every time I teach it, and I've been doing these models for uh, almost two decades. So let's suppose that the observed outcome value is three. So the, we want the probability that r sub i equals 3 according to our model. Well, this is necessarily the difference between the cumulative probability that it's 3 or less minus the cumulative probability that it's 2 or less. So where are these on this graph? Well, this cut point right here, the second one, is the probability that the response is less than or equal to 2 on the log odd scale, right? But its height on the graph here is the probability scale. So the horizontal axis is cumulative log odds. The vertical axis is, um, is cumulative probability. And so the height where that blue dot is, that's the uh, cumulative probability that the response is less than or equal to two. And then the third one is the cumulative probability that the response is less than or equal to three. And three is the value we're interested in. So we just take the difference between these two. The difference between the height of these two points is the probability r sub i equals three, according to the model. Uh, and that's also all the machine needs to calculate. We were gonna build a model that does this, that does all these little uh, incremental calculations with cumulative log odds. Uh, what we end up with is a link function. This will be a generalized linear model, a very weird one, but it will be a generalized linear model where the link function is something called the cumulative log odds or, or cumulative logit uh, link. And I'm showing it to you on the slide here. And we set that as always um, so that the cumulative uh, probability transformed by the cumulative logit is equal to our linear model. Uh, but in this case, we have one cut point uh, uh, for every, or sorry, we have one intercept alpha for every cut point. And that is we're going to have, if there are seven possible responses, we're going to have six alphas to estimate because those are the six cut points. And every unique value k has its own intercept that we're going to estimate. And then we're going to stick other things on this linear model, but we can wait a bit to do that. But in essence, uh, the locations of where those um, vertical dashed blue lines on the slide hit the horizontal axis, those are the parameters we need to estimate. And there'll be one alpha for each of those locations, and we learn them from the data. OK. What that does effectively is learn the frequency distribution of the sample with the uncertainty that it, is, it deserves given its sample size. And that's already something, right? This is a, a Bayesian version of, of, uh, of frequency estimation uh, that, that uh, respects the uncertainty in its structure. Uh, 
but we often want to have more variables in here to explain um, uh, the differences and difference between individuals and the treatment effects. So how do we make something like this a function of variables? Well, the first thing you could do is you could simply stratify the cut points by your explanatory variables. For example, you could have one set of cut points uh, for the young and one set of cut points for the old, if you're willing to uh, binarize age in that way. Uh, the second thing you can do is use uh, the classic linear model strategy. And in this case, what we do is we offset each cut point by the value of some common linear model, common to all the cut points, and we're going to call that phi sub i. So what this looks like is, well, it, it looks like a, a linear model. So phi sub i will equal some set of slopes times their uh, predictor variables. So looking at the top on the right of this slide, phi sub i equals beta times x sub i. There's no intercept in this because th the cut points are the intercepts. So if you look at the middle on the right of this slide, we have the cumulative log odds is equal to alpha sub k plus phi sub i. And that alpha sub k is the intercept that's specific to each observed value k. So the intercepts are free in this model. And if you stick them in phi, it won't destroy things, but it, you will get confused and it'll make the chains run inefficiently. They're not, it's not necessary to have extra intercepts. Um, and then uh, usually the way we denote uh, these uh, sorts of models, these cumulative log odds models in a, in a statistical definition is we have a distribution we call the ordered logit distribution. It's really a type of categorical distribution. And if you look at the section of the textbook where that explains this material, I show you how to uh, write out this model as if it were just a categorical model, but it's very messy. Uh, so, but take a look if you're interested. I'm going to use this ordered logit notation in the lecture just to make things simple. And the shape of the ordered logit comes from its linear model phi sub i and the whole vector of alphas. Uh, so when I write alpha without a subscript, I mean all of them. And in this case, it's all six of them, right? So only six because the seventh one is free. We know it's infinity. Okay. That was a lot, but let me make one more attempt uh, to give you an intuition for how this works. What you're looking at now is, on the left here is a graph you've seen before. We've got the cumulative log odds along the bottom, and we've got each cut point represented by the blue dashed lines. And then uh, the blue points are at the uh, height of where the cumulative log odds have been transformed to the cumulative proportion to probability. Yeah, so the vertical axis is just, is just probability, right? The inverse. Uh, logit of, of the log odds. And I've placed this um, black mark uh, on the horizontal axis, which is going to represent the value of phi. And I'm going to move this mark and slide it along the horizontal axis so you can see what this does to the implied distribution, uh, frequency distribution uh, from the model. Uh, way, one way to think about this, as I've tried to indicate uh, on the right of the slide, is that the horizontal axis is the value of the linear model in the ordered logit uh, GLM. So it's, it's a set of specific alphas, each alpha sub k, uh, plus the value of phi. So now let's uh, modify phi. So uh, what I'm showing you here is uh, when phi equals zero in this particular example, this is the frequency distribution that's expected. Uh, that is, the height of the red lines on the right are the distances between the uh, vertical distances between the red lines on the left. Those are the probabilities of each of the specific outcomes. And you can see, right, if you, if you look at four, four is the tallest bar on the right, and four is the tallest gap on the left between the red dashed lines. Do you see that? Okay, good, because now I'm going to start this whole thing in motion, and I'm going to let phi move. Let's increase it up to 2. And what happens is you notice that the, the blue vertical lines maintain their distances uh, with respect to one another on the cumulative log odds scale. And we've just added phi to all of them, so they don't change relative to one another. But on the probability scale, the vertical axis, they definitely change their relationships to one another because you can't go above one. And so as the probabilities get pushed up, uh, on the log, uh, as the log odds get pushed up, the probabilities uh, distances get smaller and smaller. And uh, this transforms, it mutates or morphs the whole histogram. 
And so now what you see is what this does is if you make phi bigger, it makes the lower values more likely. I'll say that again. If you make phi bigger, it makes the lower values more likely. And uh, uh, so you can see what that's done to the frequency distribution here is it's um, uh, made one have a very high value. And now let's slide it the other way. I'm going to slide it all the way down to minus two and you can watch it do the reverse. And now everything gets squished along the bottom. And now seven is the largest because we've created this big empty space overhead where uh, the outcome is going to be seven. Uh, so we can keep alternating this back and forth between two and minus two to, to prime your intuition about this thing. And this is how these models are built. You add terms to phi that distort the graph and help you understand how the predictor variables result in changes in the frequency distribution. And that's an ordered logit model in its machinery. Okay, let's start off with an easy problem and then and gradually layer in uh, uh, our estimates in this example. So to remind you, we're interested in understanding the effects of treatments X on the responses R, and we're gonna focus only on that simple causal relationship for the moment the average causal effects of each of the three um, principles, uh, action, intention, and contact. And so on the right of this slide, I've showed you uh, the simplest or sort of order, ordered logic model that contains these three factors. Um, I've made A sub I the uh, presence or absence of the action principle in a story. It's a zero one variable. And C sub I is the presence or absence of contact in the story. And capital I sub I is the presence or absence of intention in the story. And we add each of these to phi with its own coefficient, uh, beta sub A, beta sub C, or beta sub I, respectively. And then for the priors, uh, beta with that uh, flat line in the subscript there, uh, I'm going to use that in this lecture to mean any beta. So that flat line could be any letter, A, C, or I, and we're going to give them all the same prior, normal uh, with a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one half of 0 0.5. And then for each of the alphas, remember there are six of them, uh, for each of the alphas, I'm going to give it a normal zero one. Remember, these are on log odds. So this is like the log odds intercepts we talked about last week. In code form, there's no big uh, struggles here. There's a, uh, a distribution in the rethinking package called Dord Logit. Uh, you can say it Dord Logit if you like. And uh, this is the uh, ordered Logit uh, distribution. And it takes V and a vector alpha, and you define things as you'd expect. And uh, Ulam will happily run this. <clears throat> Let's look at the chains. Uh, I want to look at the trace plots here uh, because they're, they're, the chains are fine, but these trace plots are very hard to read because the chains start from such highly dispersed um, places in the probability distribution, which is good, uh, that by the time they've converged, it looks like a thin little line, and it's hard to see if there are any anomalies or anything bad going on. Uh, the trank plots, as always, uh, don't have that problem. Uh, they're much clearer, and you can see that the, these chains um, show lots of evidence of having converged and of, of good mixing. Okay, if you look at um, the marginal posterior distributions uh, from this model, uh, as in the Precy output on the right of the slide, it's pretty hard to see what's going on. All of these things are on the cumulative log odds scale, and I don't know about you, but I have a hard time thinking in cumulative log odds. Uh, it's a bit difficult to figure out what's going on. Uh, the alphas are locations on the horizontal axis, and so, of course, um, uh, the smaller ones have smaller values. They have to be. It's ordered, and it'll always be ordered that way. Uh, but you, it's hard to read these things directly. And the same goes for coefficients. You can kind of look at them and see, oh, a negative value, uh, that's going to uh, decrease things, and a positive value will increase them, but it's hard to know by how much. So you know what's coming next. We're going to simulate from the posterior distribution, pushing it back out of the model, treating it as a generative model, so that we can see what the implications of, of the machine are. Uh, doesn't take much code. I'll show you, and there are different ways to do this. Here's the way I did it for this example. 
I set up a vector called vowels that contains the, the values of the A, I, and C variables. And I set up this little vector so that I can change it easily. And then I simply use the rethinking package's sim function um, uh, to simulate from the model with those values. Uh, but I do it a hundred times because we're simulating observations and I want the expectations. And sim can only simulate uh, as many uh, observations as there are samples in the posterior. And so we got 2,000 samples from the posterior, but I want more simulations than that. So I'm going to use MC replicate um, to loop through those 2,000 a hundred times and simulate different observations. Remember, there's a different uh, contribution of the stochasticity when you push observations out of sim. So we want to average over that. Um, and I use MC replicate to use all the cores. So I use six cores here so that this finishes pretty quickly. And then I just draw the histogram, and that's what you see on the right. So I'm going to draw this type of histogram for different combinations now of the treatment variables A, I, and C. So let's take this first one where they're all off. There's no action, there's no intention, and there's no contact in the story. There are trolley stories like that. And let's compare that to one where we just turn on intention. So we take the same story and we add intention to it. Uh, and what you see is that um, uh, now it's uh, less appropriate, right? Intention tends to make things less appropriate. That is, the, the average comes down. There's many fewer sevens. Yeah. Uh, now in the middle column here, um, in, in both of these, I've turned on action, added action to both stories. So the top still has intention off and the bottom has intention on. And you can see what adding action does is it makes things smaller again. Uh, uh, adding action makes people less approving, makes, makes the responses smaller on average. But notice it's not, it's not that it does it to all of them because there's this spikiness to the distribution, right? Where the, uh, the focal points like on the end on uh, number one are more important and four still dominates a lot. And then finally, if we add contact instead of action, or contact is a special kind of action. So the way these data are coded, it's mutually exclusive from action. Um, and uh, you'll see that this is the worst of all. If you've got intent and contact in the lower right, this is the lowest average of all types of stories in the data set. And you get lots of ones. In fact, ones are the most common response. OK. So we've learned uh, average treatment effects, ignoring all the other stuff in the data, uh, but there's room for improvement. And we've got a second set of estimates, of course. We, we want to know about how differences between individuals moderate those treatment effects. And so we can take this basic structure and put in some competing causes, as they're often called. Let's think about uh, a simple one, for example, like the effect of gender. Uh, so gender has a direct effect, uh, according to the DAG that I've asserted here, um, where individuals of a different gender may have different average responses to the same story, um, or maybe just the average, different responses to the scale uh, or the task. And there's also an indirect effect through education as well. That is, if members of different genders tend to have different average levels of education, and education has a direct effect on the response, then that will also be part of the total effect of gender. So we can add that to the model simply by stratifying each of the, of the beta coefficients by gender. That is having two uh, beta sub A's and two beta sub C's and two beta sub I's in this case. So you'll see that I've modified phi. So now there's a subscript in each beta, which is G of I. So there's a, there's a one and a two there for each of them. And again, every beta in this, this is beta with the line under it. Uh, every beta, no matter what its, its special identity, gets the same normal 0, 1 half prior, and we go back to the code. In Ulam, this is easy. You just bracket each of the coefficients, and then you get a vector of them of the length of, of the unique values in G, and uh, we can run the model again. And now we look at the Precy output, and we have six of these coefficients because there are three treatments, A, I, and C, and then two genders in this data set. So we end up with six coefficients in total. And again, uh, you can kind of peer at these coefficients and, and maybe get an idea of what the relative effects are and in which direction. 
Uh, that is basically all of these things make ratings lower. Yeah, they make people disapprove more when you add action, intention, and contact. But some things are much worse than others, right? So like the coefficients for contact are the lowest. Um, that's because people disapprove of those things the most. Um, but again, it's useful to use the same sort of code as before to push these out on the frequency distribution scale because it isn't only the average that matters in this kind of model because you've got spikiness in the histograms, right? The anchor points matter a lot. Um, but in this case, what I'm showing you uh, uh, for stories which contain contact and intent, which is the kind of story that upsets people the most in these experiments, um, for gender one on the left, which is women the way I've coded it, uh, uh, the average is lower than um, on the right uh, for gender equals two, which is men in this, in this, the way I've coded it. Okay, so it seems like by that, that um, uh, women in this sample tended to disapprove more than men, or to say it the other way, men tended to be more approving of the same stories than women in this sample. But hang on, I mean, what is that estimate actually? Let's remember that this sample is a voluntary sample. Uh, there were advertisements posted online and people voluntarily in their free time went to a website and read through trolley problems. Uh, so uh, how do people get into this sample? Let's try adding that to the DAG. Uh, this is something we haven't done before, but you can do this. So it's very plausible in this case, in fact, almost certain that the demographic features of people, that is their education, their age, their gender, and other things we don't have measured about them, influence participation. And I've added participation as a node in the DAG. Uh, that is the P at the bottom. And you'll see that it has causes from E, Y, and G. Now, here's the cool thing. Well, <laughs> depends upon your definition of cool. Uh, the sample is automatically conditioned on participation, right? Because we don't have data from people who didn't participate. And P is a collider uh, of E, Y, and G. And so since the sample is conditioned on that collider, this induces collider bias. And as a result of this, even if uh, e, Y, and G don't co-vary in meaningful ways uh, in the general population. So, for example, um, gender and age do not cause one another in any sense, and yet they can co-vary because of recruitment, because they influence participation in the study. And so our sample can have additional associations among the, ex the explanatory variables that will mimic causes. And this is just another way of talking about collider bias. Sometimes you'll hear people call this endogenous selection because it means your sample is already selected. Uh, in, in this case, it's selected on a collider, which induces associations, non-causal associations among your explanatory variables. And these can mislead you. They can be confounds in the general sense of the term. The consequence of this is that it's not possible from this sample to estimate the total effect of gender. The reason is because it's got confounding paths through the collider that connects it to education and age. And so whatever we just measured about the gender effects in those coefficients is not the effect of gender. It's some confounded effect of gender, almost certainly, that is a result of the fact that um, uh, gender and age and education are all influencing participation in some way. So it's not really interpretable as a total causal effect. But we can get the direct effect of gender in this case because we can stratify by education and age and block the collider contamination. And if you analyze the graph with your eyes, I, I hope you can see that by now. You've gotten practice at this. But if you're not at that level yet, that's fine. I encourage you to fire up uh, a tool like Daggety at daggety.net uh, or use the, the Daggety R package, put this DAG on this slide into it, and then ask it for adjustment sets for different queries. And it'll tell you that it is possible to get the direct effect of G, but not the total effect of G. And the reason is because of participation. We've already conditioned on participation. So we're gonna stratify also uh, by education and age 
and gender simultaneously. That's what we have to do to answer our S demands. But there are things we can't get. We can't get the total causal effect of gender, and we also, by analogy, cannot get the total causal effect of age, because it is also, simil for the same reason, uh, contaminated by the collider bias. Let's look at these um, variables, education and age now, and their, and their distributions in the sample. It's pretty obvious that this is not a random sample of the population, and very plausible that these variables are partly driving participation. So on the left in the red, I'm showing you educational level, and this is an ordered variable. Uh, it's like the outcome, it's ordered, but it's, it's educational level. One is elementary school, and eight is having a doctorate, a PhD. Uh, the most common values in this sample are some college five uh, and, the, and having a bachelor's degree. And that's because college students are the main participants uh, of this experiment. It was advertised at universities. Um, and then on the right, you look at the age distribution. Uh, this is not the distribution of, uh, of, of any country this experiment had, had significant participation from. In fact, it's not the age distribution of any human population, right? Uh, it doesn't look anything like this. Um, but that's okay. Uh, you can still make inferences with non-random samples. You just have to um, think carefully about whether uh, which particular S demands are confounded by uh, uh, the possibility that these features are driving recruitment in particular ways. Okay, that's a lot. We've learned some basic machinery of the ordered uh, logit model and thought hard about what is actually a fairly complicated causal structure, even though it's an experiment. So I think you've earned a break. Uh, why don't you take a walk? Have a cold or hot beverage as you prefer, and when you come back, I'll be here. All right, welcome back. Let's pick up where we left off. Before the break, we were talking about two of the predictor variables, education and age, and adding them to the ordered logistic regression. Uh, let's talk about education for a while, because there's an interesting feature about the education variable, as I mentioned before the break, is that it's also an ordered variable, like the outcome. But it's not a subjective response, it's an objective measurement of how far uh, each person has gone in their education. Well, it's self-reported. It's a self-reported measure of how far each person has gone in their education. But it's ordered because, of course, there's a progression from elementary school to middle school to secondary school to college to master's degree to PhD. And that creates an ordering that we want to pay attention to. And like the outcome, it's, it's uh, unlikely that each level has the same uh, effect in the sense that there's no constant distance in, in effect in this case between one and two and two and three in the education variable. So there's an obvious and extremely useful solution to this problem for predictor variables. I remember our goal is to stratify the outcome uh, by the levels of the education. And so we can easily do that. We can just have a different parameter for each level of education and estimate it. And in principle, that's no problem. We have a lot of data here. It'd be no problem to have uh, seven uh, parameters for education. We only need seven, even though there are eight levels of the education variable, as you see on the right, because one of them is already, is in a sense, free. It's already accounted for by the um, cut points, by the alpha parameters. But we'd also like to enforce an ordering. Uh, that is, we'd like the effect of education to be monotonic. Uh, and that means either always increasing with increasing education or decreasing with increasing education. That is, its causal effect on the outcome should be monotonic. And this is nice uh, because it'll make estimation more accurate. Uh, and it's the kind of um, uh, functional assumption that often gives us a way to identify causal effects when it's accurate. Uh, so uh, what we mean to do here to enforce a, uh, some ordering to this is make it so that um, each level adds an increment. Let me break that down in the next several slides and show you what, what I mean. 
Uh, but before I do that, I want to uh, tell you that this is a, a very industry standard, uh, if you will, way to treat um, ordered predictors. That is, if you have an ordered variable, an ordered categorical variable on the right-hand side of your regression, this is an extremely common and useful way uh, to include it in your model. So let's consider the first level of education, which in this data set is elementary school, having completed elementary school. And uh, we're going to consider, we're going to construct this uh, example uh, thinking of there being no other predictors in phi, the linear model of our ordered logit. And so phi sub i equals zero in this case, because as I said, the first level of education is in a sense free because its distribution is taken account of by the intercepts, by the alphas. But what about the second one? Well, for the second one, which is middle school in this uh, data set, we're going to add a special parameter for it, which I'm going to call delta, and it's delta sub 1. There will be a series of deltas, one for each level of education above the first. And so uh, we, we move the cumulative log odds of uh, the outcome variable by delta sub 1, and the model needs to learn if delta is positive or negative. And then for some high school, which is level three, we add both delta one and delta two, where delta two is a new parameter that's specific to the increment of some high school. And so this is what establishes the monotonic ordering of the causal effect of education is that we're gonna keep piling up these deltas. And so for high school, which is level four, it's delta sub one plus delta sub two, plus delta sub three, and so on. For level five, there will be four deltas, and for level six, there will be five deltas, and for level seven, there will be six deltas. And uh, level eight, the doctor at the highest level, there will be seven. For this last uh, level, the doctorate, um, it's very useful to transform these deltas by first saying that if you sum them all up, they equal a parameter beta sub e, which is the maximum effect of education. And remember, this could be positive or negative, yeah, because education could increase uh, the acceptability of stories to people or it could decrease it. And then what we're gonna do next is we're gonna transform the deltas so that there's something called a simplex. I'll, I'll say this again, so hang on if you haven't gotten it on the first pass. So. We're going to say that uh, there's a little imaginary parameter delta sub zero, which equals zero, which is the effect of the first level of education, elementary. And this is just a placeholder to help us remember that the uh, first level of education is taken care of by the intercepts, by the alphas. And then for all the others, uh, we're going to say that they sum to one. We're going to enforce this, actually. So if we sum from zero to seven, all the delta sub j's, from j equals zero to seven, we make them equal one. Why are we doing this? Well, because it lets us uh, set phi, our linear model, with a simple little summation. It makes it compact. And this is what we're gonna do. Let me explain this to you. So phi will equal now beta sub e, which is the maximum effect of education, multiplied by the sum of all the deltas up to the educational level of the individual on row i. I'll say that again. So phi sub i, which is the adjustment to the cumulative log odds for case i, will be equal to beta sub e, which is the maximum effect of education, and this, we estimate this, remember, times the sum of all the deltas, where the deltas are these proportional increments from each educational level, but only up to the educational level of the individual and you'll notice it's, it's e sub i, which is the educational level of the individual, minus one, because remember the first level, elementary, is kind of taken out of this. It's assigned an index of zero. And so the delta sub j's only go up to um, the maximum level of education minus one. So if you have a doctorate, uh, you sum up to seven because that's the length of the delta vector. Okay. I know that that maybe seems a little weird, uh, but really all it is is a standard additive model where um, we've just scaled the delta so they sum to one because it makes it possible for us to summarize the overall effect of education 
by this beta sub e in front. It makes it easier to think about that. And it's often much easier to assign priors that way because we can assign a sensibly sized prior to beta sub e um, because we might have good scientific uh, information about the maximum effect of education on such a thing. Uh, but even if we don't, it's much easier to assign, uh, assign sensible priors to the maximum effect than it is to each incremental effect. Still, oh, I should say before I explain uh, that, um, as I said, these delta parameters now form something called a simplex because we've made them sum to one. They're constrained to sum to one. A simplex is just a name for a vector of real numbers that sum to one, which, if you're paying attention, uh, means they're also probabilities, can be interpreted as probabilities. Uh, and this leads us to uh, finding a prior for them now. We need a prior for each of these delta sub j's, as I show on the right uh, in the mathematical formula of the model at the bottom. Where, what do we replace that question mark with? Well, it turns out there are probability distributions for probability distributions. I'll say that again. It turns out there are probability distributions for probability distributions. And the meaning that we draw vectors of numbers that sum to one because that's what a probability distribution is. And that's what we need as a prior for the vector of deltas uh, so that they're still constrained to sum to one. The most famous distribution that meets our criteria is the Dirichlet. And uh, uh, Dirichlet is uh, named after a, a Belgian German mathematician who did lots of really important work in, in pure and applied mathematics. And uh, this is just one of the things named after him. The Dirichlet distribution um, takes as its input, it gives it its shape, a vector of the same length as the number of categories you want to draw probabilities for. So uh, we want uh, seven. We want a delta of length seven because there are eight levels of education. And remember, the first one's free, so we only need seven parameters. And so we want to assign our vector delta, which is of length seven, a Dirichlet distribution. Um, and we, its shape is given by this uh, parameter a here. And a is just a vector here of seven twos. Now what do these twos mean? Well, you could probably guess because they're all the same value, that means a priori all of the possible uh, levels of education are, are, have the same a priori effect uh, increment, because that's what we're drawing here, right? Is proportional incremental effects, uh, a proportion of the maximum beta sub e. So we assign them all two, and that means a priori every level of education. Uh, has the same effect. But the size of these numbers in the a vector determine uh, how much variation there is uh, across. So I'm animating here draws from this uh, Dirichlet distribution with uh, where the shape is given by a vector of seven twos. And you'll see that they're hardly ever equal even though the twos are all the same. Uh, the independent draws jumble all over the place. And <clears throat> the smaller the numbers in the a vector, the more variation there will be. Uh, the bigger the numbers get, the more similar uh, the, or flatter the distribution gets. So let me show you if we make the a vector seven tens instead, instead, you'll see that now there's much less jostling around. And this is like a prior that expects a lot more similarity among them. We don't really expect the increments of every educational level to be the same, right? The, the impact of elementary school and college are probably not the same. So I'm going to stick with the, the prior on the left. Uh, but before we stick this in the model, I want to show you one other thing to prime your intuition about the Dirichlet distribution is that the A's don't have to be equal. So here's on the right uh, uh, drawing uh, vectors from a Dirichlet where a is set to be the integers 1 to 7. And uh, now you'll see that this means that the, the higher values are, are given higher probability, right? because they have higher numbers. And you can do anything in between, and uh, you, you can even have fractions in the a vector as well. Um, those of you who know the beta distribution, the Dirichlet is um, uh, is a generalization of the beta distribution. The beta distrib or you could say the beta distribution is a Dirichlet with only two events, uh, an A vector of length two. Okay, 
Dereclay is very useful. It pops up in lots of applied problems, and it's going to solve our problem here of putting a sensible prior on the on the vector of deltas, uh, so that they still sum to one. Here's the uh, Ulam code to make this work. The top of the code box on this slide, I merely extract um, the educational levels uh, from the raw data. Unfortunately, the factor codes in the raw data are not ordered properly as education proceeds. So I have given you the educational levels in their proper reordering and done that for you in the variable called edunu, uh, which, which represents education as a proper ordered um, predictor. And then uh, we're going to feed the Dirichlet prior, that is a, a vector of seven twos, into the model as data. Uh, and then there's the ULAM code where uh, you see in the line for phi our beta sub e times the sum, literally we use the sum function, of the delta j vector up to the individual's educational level. And, uh, and then the rest of the linear model, the, the uh, action intention and contact effects are still there. Um, and at the bottom of the ULAM code, you'll see that there's a little bit of housekeeping to do to build up the delta J vector, where the, at first this append row command is used to put the zero on the front of it. That's for the first level, the, the elementary school level, where the, the increment is zero always, because it's taken care of by the alphas. And, um, and then at the very bottom, we define a simplex of link seven, which is the deltas, which is given the Dirichlet um, distribution. Okay, run this model, it mixes quite well uh, and uh, shouldn't take too long to load, um, I mean to finish mixing. And again, you can look at the, the Precy output as always, and it's a bit mystical, but um, and you probably shouldn't spend too much time staring at this because that way lies madness, but you can see uh, the um, seven delta uh, parameters that have been estimated at the bottom and that they are proportions because they are proportions of the total effect BE, uh, which here is negative, which indicates that higher education tends to decrease how like how appropriate people think the stories are on average in the total sample. Okay, but uh, there's a problem interpreting this because of the fact that the the sample is well, selected probably on the demographics, on education. Remember, the college students are vastly overrepresented and probably don't think like most of the population, not in my experience. And uh, uh, so we've got this conditioning on a collider on participation, which creates these um, non-causal associations between education uh, and um, the response. In other words, uh, there are non-causal paths uh, associating um, educational levels with responses through age and gender. <clears throat> and so we can't interpret BE here as the causal effect of education. That would be unwarranted. Uh, so I hope this, this reemphasizes to you how important it is to think about how the sample is caused. Right? It's not just the process by which people make ratings of these stories. It's, it's the process by which people ended up in the data set that we're modeling with the DAG here. And that affects our interpretation and construction of statistical models. So what do we do about this? Well, we've got to add the other predictors. Uh, if we, we, we can identify through the backdoor criterion, we can identify the, the effect of education if we simultaneously stratify by age and gender. Now, take a look at the DAG, reassure yourself that that's true. And again, as always, if you can't quite figure out why that's true, practice with daggity.net or the daggity package, um, and then uh, look at it yourself again and uh, try to figure out why that's the case. Um, but the intuition is it blocks all the non-causal paths. Okay. So in order to estimate the direct effect of education, we need to simultaneously stratify by age and gender. And here's a model to do it. So on the right, we've got a really big phi, uh, linear model component. We'll just take it one step at a time. It'll make sense. So first, we have the ordered monotonic effect of education. But now we're stratifying the maximum effect by gender. So you'll see g of i in the subscript of, of beta sub e. And then we have, uh, as before, 
the um, treatments, action, intention, and contact. Again, stratified by gender. We'd already done that. And now we've added age. And there are lots of things we could do to model age in this model. Um, I've just made it a simple linear effect on the log odd scale, on the cumulative log odd scale, although I'm not really satisfied with that. And there are other things that I'd, I'd probably try if, if I had a lot more time in this lecture to do it in. Uh, we'll talk about modeling things like age more flexibly uh, in a couple of weeks. Um, and then the priors are familiar. Uh, uh, these have not changed since the beginning, and we still have the Deary Clay prior uh, for the effects of education. Setting up the code, um, you just make a long fee. It's no problem. And you can break it across lines if you need to so that it's easier to read, as I've done here. Uh, but otherwise, there's no tricks. You've just got a lot of uh, parameters, so you've got a lot of priors. Uh, but it's, it's all the meanings, I hope, are clear. Uh, one thing to note on this is uh, this is a pretty big model now. And uh, one thing you can often do with... Um, uh, with ULA models, uh, since they use STAN, is you can multi-thread them. So for a lot of models, but not all models, if you set threads to a number greater than one, so here um, I've set the threads argument to two, then each chain will use multiple cores. This is a data set that's really uh, set up to take advantage of this because as I said it's almost 10,000 responses and so if we can take about 5,000 of those and send them to one core and the other 5,000 to the other core the cores can take the derivatives uh, some, uh, separately and then put it all back together uh, because uh, uh, it's additive that is it's factor factorizable by each row um, not all analysis problems uh, can be factored that way so you can't always do this uh, but when you can, it can save you a lot of time. Uh, so in this case, uh, four chains, each uses two threads. So that's eight cores total. Lots of uh, computers have eight cores these days. And my laptop has 12 for some reason. Um, and when you run this, uh, just to give you an idea, this is not that big a model. and doesn't take that long to run, but it's certainly the slowest model so far in this course. And so this model will run with one thread. Um, each chain takes about 10 minutes total. I show you in the output in the upper right there. With two threads per chain, it only takes uh, about uh, between six and seven minutes, uh, less than seven minutes always total. Now, maybe that's not a big deal. Uh, it isn't. Um, but as your models get bigger and bigger, that uh, that savings um, uh, st st may stay proportionally the same, but in total time, it grows real fast. And so it can definitely be worth it to use additional threads. Um, Many computers these days have lots of separate cores, so you should take advantage of them. I should say that Ulam has to make some guesses about how to multi-thread these things, and so uh, this doesn't going to work automatically for any arbitrary model that you can fit with Ulam, but it'll work for lots of GLMs, and that's the way I've written it. Um, if you learn uh, to write stan code directly, you'll have a lot more flexibility and learn a lot more about when you can make this work and optimize it in additional ways. Okay, so that model runs, uh, uh, six and a half minutes of time well spent. We look at the Precy output here for this model, or uh, poetically called model uh, MRXEYGT. Uh, uh, that is, I say, it's a model of the response R that includes as predictors X, uh, E, Y, and G, and the little t for threaded. Uh, and I'm just showing you all these parameters. Um, I don't like to interpret parameters, as I keep saying, but there's some stuff that's useful uh, to point out by taking a tour through this table. So, so let me do that. Uh, the first is, if we look at the treatment effects stratified by gender, um, keep in mind that uh, uh, this is only the direct effect of gender. Yeah, we haven't estimated the total causal effect of gender, and in fact, we cannot. I'll say that again. These coefficients are only the direct effect of gender, estimates of, uh, because we, we stratified by, by education and age, uh, and if, when we stratify by education, we block the indirect path, indirect path of gender. Um, and if we didn't stratify by education, the estimate would be confounded by the sample selection, by participation P. And so in this case, we cannot estimate the total causal effect of gender in an unconfounded way. Uh, but we can if this DAG is correct, get the direct effect, and that's not nothing. 
that's something. And what you see here is that there are um, uh, there there do appear to be um, uh, reliable differences uh, for some of the uh, treatments. But in general, the pattern is very similar, where um, uh, uh, action and intent are uh, less bothersome to people than contact. Uh, then we have education effects. And uh, this is what we were after all along. And this is the direct effect of education stratified by gender. And what I want you to see now is that it's opposite directions uh, for women and men in the sample, according to this, this model. So uh, beta E1 is the coefficient for women. And so this says that more educated women in the sample um, tended to give lower ratings to the same stories that more educated men gave higher ratings to. Yeah, you see that in the direction of the coefficients. So this is an interesting thing that we didn't see when we only had the average effect that was not stratified uh, by gender. Um, age. Uh, age, like gender here, we're only getting uh, the direct effect, and we cannot estimate the total causal effect of age. Part of the causal effect of age, according to this DAG, goes through education, as shown in the image. And that is confounded by sample selection, by participation P in this. So, But we do get the direct effect here because we've stratified by education. That blocks that indirect path, and it also blocks the confounding. Um, and we can get the direct effect, but we cannot get the total effect of age. One of the th things that this stops us from doing, actually, with this model and these data, is that we cannot say um, what the causal effect of age is in total. Yeah, if you imagine an aging population and how their judgments of these stories might change, that's something we will need additional information on from outside the sample in order to estimate the causal effect of, because uh, what do we need? We need the causal effect of age on education, which is always confounded in this data and these samples because P effectively, effectively acts like a confounder of, of the uh, influence of Y on E. Finally, uh, there are all these deltas. Since we found that beta E uh, is in opposite signs for the two genders in the sample, uh, we probably want to run a version of this model where there are two delta vectors as well to see if those are radically different. And I'm not going to show you that model in the lecture for the sake of time, but in the script uh, that goes along with this lecture, lecture 11, I'll show you that model so you can see how to specify it and you can pull up the coefficients and look. Okay, it's often true in realistic data analysis situations that the causal effects of interest are actually very complicated uh, and they're not well summarized by the coefficients that come out of the model. Now I know I've said that before, but this is a new level of complexity. But if the complexity comes from the science and not from the statistics. The statistics are just the coefficients. And the problem is that the coefficients in nonlinear models hardly ever tell us about the counterfactuals of interest. So remember, usually what we're after as researchers is the ability to predict the consequence of some hypothetical intervention or actual intervention if you're in the applied sciences. And this requires marginalization. It requires averaging over values of the other predictors, uh, the ones that you're not intervening on. And some of those may be influenced by your intervention, uh, but even if the other, and you definitely need to to average over those, uh, simulate their values as influenced by your intervention. But even the other ones, you have to make some decision about what the target population is and how you're going to do this. Let's think of some examples. Suppose we want the causal effect of education. Well, in order to calculate that for any particular target population, we're going to have to put in some distribution of ages and the genders in the population to average over because the effect of education uh, the effect of education will vary on uh, depending on that, even if there's no explicit dependency between those effects in the linear model, because this is a nonlinear model. And in a nonlinear model, remember, if any one effect pushes uh, the expectation high towards the ceiling or low towards the floor of the outcome space, then necessarily every predictor moderates every other predictor. And so this marginalization step is not optional. Uh, you really have to do it to do it right. Um, 
So uh, there are some problems in this particular example. Uh, in addition, we can't use the sample distribution of ages and genders for this marginalization if we're going to going to calculate the causal effect of education here, because this sample is in effect cursed by voluntary participation uh, by the p variable. Uh, the age distribution and the gender distribution. Uh, are just a feature of this sample. They're not a feature of any population we care about. So we need to use external demographic information to choose a distribution of Y and G that we'd like to use to calculate some hypothetical causal effect of education. The other complication with a causal effect of education in this example is it doesn't make any sense uh, to set uh, everybody's education to the same value because there is necessarily a very strong causal relationship between age and education. You can't create 10-year-olds um, with PhDs. Uh, that, is not a plausible, that is not a possible intervention. So you have to think in a much more subtle way about what sorts of interventions are realistic that you'd actually want to calculate some, some expected causal effect for. And that could be accelerating at a particular grade. It could be uh, accelerating college. Uh, and then that will necessarily affect some age groups more than others. Um, and I know this sounds complicated, but it's just complication that arises because of the causal structure of the scientific problem. It's not inherently a statistical problem. It's a scientific problem. And that means you can control it because you have scientific knowledge about your problems. If you don't study uh, moral psychology and trolley problems, uh, this may seem more confusing than it would actually be if you were working in your own context where you understand the scientific background and these tasks become much easier in that case, believe me. So another example, uh, say we want the causal effect of age. Well, getting the causal effect of age requires knowing the direct effect of age on education. As I just said, there's a strong relationship and it is causal. Um, and uh, but we can't estimate that with this sample and so if we'd like to compute uh, a marginal causal effect of age uh, how how and that would mean how do people's judgments change with age then we need to get some estimate of the causal effect of age on education from somewhere else outside this sample and if we could do that then we can do that then we can get the causal effect. And that is possible, right? Because you can get information about the target population and the rates at which people uh, gain education as they age, and that's all that causal effect means. Um, and then uh, you can complete the calculation. Okay, this is complicated because it's just reality, and that's what it is. But the good news is, um, once you understand the structure of this, the algorithm is always the same. It's just that we're gonna use a generative simulation using posterior samples. And that's all these causal uh, counterfactuals are. If you've got the generative model, you can use the posterior samples to simulate a range of scenarios, each conforming to whichever uh, causal intervention you're interested in. So we need a generative model to plan the estimation. We need the DAG and functions to uh, embed in it just to plan the statistical estimation strategy. But then we also need the generative model to compute the estimates, that is the causal estimates. Okay, this has been a long lecture. Uh, there's one thing to say that'll bridge us to the next. In this data set, there are some variables we have not dealt with yet, and we probably should, and these are competing causes. So the first are the 30 different stories. These are the trolley stories that uh, the researchers added and subtracted action, intent, and contact to. There are 30 of them, and they're repeated uh, hundreds of times in the data set. And these stories, possibly, quite probably, have features about them which also affect people's judgments, features other than action, intention, and contact. And we haven't coded those features because we don't know what they are necessarily. But we can statistically estimate if each of these stories induces higher or lower responses. And so we'd want to do that as well. All I'm showing you on the screen here is the frequency table for the different 30 different stories. And you see that some of them are much more common than others. And then there are also, uh, there's another variable, which I'm just going to add to the DAG now, and I'm going to call it U. And these are features of the individuals which we have not observed. Uh, there are 331 individuals in the data set, and each of them have contributed 30 responses. And uh, 
We can do the same thing with the individuals we can do with the stories. Individuals may have particular attitudes and experiences and moral theories which influence how they respond to this task. And um, some individuals are taking it more seriously than others, some less. And we don't have measurements about those things, but we do know the identities of each individual, or rather we can tie each response to a unique individual. And so statistically, we could try to estimate these U values as well. Um, however, there are 331 of these parameters to estimate and only 30 data points with which to estimate each one. And this opens up a big area in statistics where we can think about the choices we have in trying to efficiently estimate uh, a large number of parameters with a small amount of data for each. And it turns out there's some clever stuff to learn here. And that's what we're going to start looking at in the next lecture when I introduce you to multi-level models. Okay, that has been lecture 11. We're in week six. In the next lecture, we'll introduce you to multi-level models and we'll have a bit of a marathon of multi-level models uh, where all of next week will also be multi-level models. And then in the beginning of week eight, uh, and Gaussian processes in week eight are also a kind of multi-level model. Um, I've spread the material out so it goes slow. Um, and in the next lecture, we'll just do the basics. And I'll see you there.